right, let's get started. We are excited to welcome Dr. Ekman again with us here at Warrior University. Dr. Ekman will be talking to us about acute chest syndrome. Again, the patients, caregivers, and community-based organizations of the Sickle Cell Consortium are delighted to provide Warrior University as an online curriculum-based education module. However, please note that this is a general discussion and is not meant to replace the advice or instructions of your doctor or other health care profession. Statements made are not meant to reflect the foster of community conflict and do not imply endorsement or recruitment to any product, service, or clinical trial. As a reminder, this class is recorded and will be made publicly available online. Private questions may be addressed to me. There is a chat box on the slide. If you hover over the chat box, you will see, um, how, or if you hover over anyone's name, you'll see a chat box pop up, and that's how you can access the chat box. If you would like to address your question privately, select my name, Lakia Bailey, before and then type the question there. If not, please address it to everyone and we will get to the question. Again, I ask everyone to please self-mute your line to cut down on background noise. Dr. Ekman today is with us to talk about acute syndrome. He is, as you see, Professor Emeritus of Hematology and Medical Oncology with the Winship Cancer Institute at Emory University School of Medicine. Dr. Agnes, thank you for joining us again, and the presentation is headed over to you to get started. <clears throat> thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we hear you just fine. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to be here tonight and really to talk about a very important a complication of uh, sickle cell disease, acute chest syndrome. Um, again, I uh, have no um, financial or professional relationships with industry that would be a conflict of interest. And I'm not going to talk about any off-label uh, use of medications during my presentation. So what I would like to do to uh, tonight or today is to um, you all up to speed and as to what acute chest syndrome is. And I, I think that's a really important um, uh, issue because it's such an important problem in sickle cell disease and we'll develop that as we do this uh, in the evening. Uh, I'm gonna go over the causes of acute chest syndrome um, and also um, to emphasize the fact that it can be very serious but it's very um, uh, treatable and uh, good management really now has uh, excellent outcomes. And um, we're gonna talk about that. I wanna also have you understand how the uh, basic causes of the acute chest are addressed in terms of treatment. And then finally, I wanna talk about the most important aspect of acute chest and that is how we might be able to prevent it uh, going forward in children and adults with sickle cell disease. Now, um, acute chest syndrome is really a syndrome. That is, it's a comp it's a group of symptoms that somebody has and, and findings. And um, individuals usually have respiratory symptoms uh, that can include things like a cough, or what's called air hunger. And, and really that's just feeling that you're not able to get enough oxygen in your body and it can't be described um, any other way. Uh, very often what we feel or we say is we're short of breath and that's really another way of, of describing what air hunger is. And then the, very often the breathing rate is, is very rapid uh, and that's an important sign that, that body may not be getting enough oxygen. Uh, chest pain is a very common uh, finding um, in acute chest syndrome. And then really the hallmark of the, the disorder is the fact that there's a new 
infiltrate on chest x-ray. That is, normally the chest lung fields are clear, and in uh, acute chest syndrome, there's a new uh, infiltrate. Uh, we'll talk about fever as, a, as a, another symptom. And then the most important thing and bottom line is, is that all of the symptoms and some of the findings that we have are really related to the fact that the oxygen in the blood is, is too low. That's called hypoxia. This is critically important because as you know, oxygen is really important to prevent hemoglobin S from, from sickling inside the red cell. And if the oxygen is low in the blood, then uh, sickling is more likely to occur and be more severe. So this leads to complications. Now, all of these symptoms in somebody that didn't have be called pneumonia. And uh, generally speaking, this acute chest syndrome is a type of pneumonia, but we don't use that term in sickle cell disease because in, in sickle cell, the uh, co the causes are, are much more complicated than they are in, in somebody who doesn't have sickle cell disease. And when an individual that doesn't have sickle cell disease has pneumonia, that's almost always related to a viral infection, a virus, or a bacteria. Um, and so um, pneumonia usually is reserved for somebody that has an infection of the lungs. And as you'll see in sickle cell disease, it's, it's much more complicated than that. Now, this is a chest x-ray, and I'm going to show you a little bit of medicine here. We have to, to help you understand what, what, what's really going on. And this is a very normal x-ray. The heart is normal. This is a, the shadow scene here. That's the heart. Uh, these little paint lines here are ribs. These are the uh, clavicles or um, collarbone. And these are the vertebral bodies back here. And what you see here are the lung fields. And, and normally they're black because there's nothing there except a few blood vessels and some very fine bronchioles that don't show up on, on x-ray. And so this is a normal chest exam. And one of the, one of the problems in, in acute chest syndrome is when somebody first presents to the hospital with this, very often the chest x-ray is negative and, and there really are no findings on chest x-ray. Uh, and as the, the uh, individual uh, progresses either in the hospital or if they go home and have to come back again, um, the, later on there will be infiltrates. Hospitalized uh, patients, this is almost always occurs because the person is dehydrated and when they come in the hospital they get IV fluids and then that allows the pneumonia to, to show up. Um, very often doctors can actually hear changes in the lungs that, that uh, tell them that there's a pneumonia present or an infiltrate present uh, and the chest x-ray will still be negative. So the fact that the chest x-ray is normal at, at the beginning doesn't really uh, preclude that, that somebody does have acute chest syndrome. Now I'm going to talk about some studies. And I'm, tonight I'm going to present data because I think it really is necessary to understand this. This is a very poorly defined um, set of uh, uh, clinical symptoms, uh, physical findings, uh, x-ray findings, and laboratory data. And, and it's very different in, in children and adults. And I'm really going to try and cover acute chest uh, syndrome over the entire lifespan of individuals. Um, and one of the first studies that I want to uh, talk about is a very old study. It was actually done in the, mainly in the 80s and 90s. It's called the Cooperative Study of Sickle Cell Disease that you've probably heard about. And acute chest was one of the things that they looked at. And in, that, in those studies, there were um, 3,751 subjects uh, who were followed for about 10 years. So it's a very large number of patients uh, and uh, a long period of, um, of observation. Uh, there were 1,722 acute chest episodes. So you can see that this is a pretty common complication. Um, and this occurred in 937 individuals. So, so right away you see that, that 
many individuals will have repeated acute chest syndrome episode. And so one of the characteristics of acute chest syndrome is if you have one episode, it puts you at a higher risk of having many more in the future. And then we'll come back to that at the end in terms of prevention. Now the children and adults both have this occur commonly, but it's very different in the, in the children and the adults. In children, um, they very often don't have pain and they're not in a pain crisis and they may not have chest pain, but they usually present with fever, uh, cough, um, and other respiratory symptoms, short of breath or rapid breathing. Uh, very often at the beginning, the, the uh, physical examination is normal and um, the uh, in physical exam and x-ray only develop over time. In adults, they're very often without fever. Uh, they may have uh, chills and short of breath and in adults, severe pain is more common. And so the adults often will present the opposite way. They will present with a pain crisis or chest pain. And then over time, they'll uh, develop uh, the acute chest syndrome. In children, the x-ray usually shows isolated upper or middle lobe infiltrates. Whereas in the, the adults, very often multiple lobes in the, in the lung are involved. And the lung is divided into six lobes, and um, it, the more that are involved, the more severe the, the problem is. Um, lobe infiltrates are much more common in adults. Um, in children, uh, blood infections where the bacteria that's causing the chest actually gets into the bloodstream are more common, and this is much less common in adults. Uh, Again, in part, bacterial infection is, is less common as a less common in adults. So children present with fever and adults present with pain. Um, the outcomes um, are a little different in this study. Um, uh, the children in this study, and this was done a long time ago, they had fewer transfusions, but they tended to be transfused earlier. And uh, the adults had more transfusions and they had longer hospital stays. So in children, um, uh, the, the disease is much shorter usually uh, than in, in the adults who have a more prolonged uh, uh, hospitalizations and symptoms from the problem. And then in children, there's a very low mortality rate, less than about 1%, and it's about four times higher in adults. And so uh, the adults are, are much less resilient and, and have more problems with this than, than the children do. And this is just a graphic depiction of the, the difference um, in between children and adults in terms of symptoms. And you can see here that the pain is the clear bar on the left at, in each of these age ranges. And in young children, it's very uncommon to have pain. And in adults, it gets to be more and more common. Uh, and then the opposite is true for, with fever, which is on the right side with the stippling. And young children present with fever. Uh, and this becomes uh, less and less common as they get older. Uh, the other thing that's very important is that this has a very uh, strong uh, seasonal variation. And there's a peak uh, incidence of acute chest syndrome uh, that occurs uh, in the, starts in the fall and peaks in the winter. And acute chest syndrome is very much less common in summer. And, and this really is clearly in part related to the fact that, that viral infections play a big role. Uh, and as the children uh, go back to school, uh, they, uh, they and themselves get uh, infected with viruses and then they take them home and their families also get infected. And uh, one of the major uh, viruses that uh, now we have to worry about is influenza, which of course has a onset in the fall and it peaks during the winter months and then it falls off again. And again, we'll come back to that uh, with with prevention. Are there any questions to this point? Any uh, questions that anybody would ask, like to ask? 
as a reminder, you can post your question in the chat or unmute yourself and ask. The chat is usually the easiest way. Okay, if there are none uh, now, I will continue and, and we will have opportunities to, to ask a, a lot of questions later. So uh, another study that I think is extremely important was done about a, a decade later. Um, and uh, this was um, the National Acute Chest Syndrome Study Group. And, and this was a group of individuals who Dr. Vincinski uh, organized to study um, acute chest in detail. Uh, and they recruited uh, 538 subjects and had over 671 episodes of acute chest to, to look at. Um, and their findings were a little bit different than the natural history study because this was more of a prospective study. And uh, they found that more individuals uh, presented with pain episodes, and this may in part related to the fact that the, the subjects tended to be a little bit older. Uh, low oxygen was almost universal. They also noted that, that very often there was a, a very significant decrease in the hemoglobin concentration, the, the level of hemoglobin, and, and this occurred quite rapidly extremely important because when the hemoglobin is low, the blood can't carry as much oxygen. And if the oxygen is already low, uh, the, um, uh, the, the problem is compounded. And so this is something that has to be addressed with acute death syndrome. And then they had a very uh, significant uh, multi-lober uh, pneumonia. Multiple different parts of the lung were involved by the infections or the acute chest syndrome. Uh, very long hospital stays. For an average pain crisis, the average is about four days. Uh, if somebody had acute syndrome, it was about uh, 10 and a half days. Uh, transfusions were in large numbers of individuals, over three fourths of them, or almost three fourths of them. Transfusions in this study were actually more often given in children than they were in adults. This is very uh, can be very severe, and in 13% of, of subjects overall, uh, they actually had to be intubated and put on a resp respirator to support their oxygen in their blood, and, and indicating that uh, there was a very severe reduction in the in the oxygen in the blood and the ability to get oxygen from the lungs into the bloodstream. And this was even more common in, in adults with 22% having uh, this problem. Um, even though they had very severe uh, involvement and had to be put on a respirator, over 80% uh, recovered. Um, the other thing that was noted in this study that had never been noted before was that there was often neurologic syndromes that occurred at the same time. And these could be frank strokes. Sometimes they were just episodes of uh, reduced um, um, uh, uh, weakness uh, or uh, confusion. And uh, they had a, a very uh, significant death rate uh, for acute chest of about 3%. And we'll come back to that later. Now, they did a very, very aggressive workup to try and figure out what the cause of the uh, acute chest syndrome was. And this included uh, doing all sorts of cultures and all sorts of laboratory tests. And in fact, they were trying to actually do a bronchoscopy where, where they would look down into the lungs with a, with a fiber optic scope and then take a washing and, and actually culture the, the deep in the lung to see if they could isolate infections. And so um, th this, th this study was really important to help us understand why it occurred. And, and there were some real surprises. Uh, one of the most significant was that pulmonary fat embolism uh, was a very common cause uh, of acute chest, almost 10%. Um, and the, the, the individuals who had evidence for this uh, problem also had the more severe um, uh, types of acute chest syndrome. And, and this is, is, was a real surprise because this syndrome 
pulmonary fat embolism is usually only seen in individuals who have trauma uh, where um, and they have crush injuries that involve the bones. And so the, the fat that's usually in the middle of the bone, the bone marrow, that fat is squeezed out into the veins and then it lodges in the lungs, the brain and the kidneys. And when this was found in acute chest syndrome, it, 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 it raised the possibility that in fact, uh, the, the, the pain that was occurring during the pain crisis was causing enough damage to the bone. So this fat was being released from the bone marrow uh, as a complication of the sickle cell disease, not a complication of a, a severe a trauma. Um, an, an infection was present in almost a third of the individuals. Uh, and um, this was 6% uh, was related to virus, about 20% bacteria, and about 4% were mixed. Um, the other thing that, that, that was clearly documented was infarction. And, and this is, um, we'll come back to this, I'll show you a picture of this. Uh, but basically, um, the sickling of the sickle cells um, directly causes enough blockage of the blood vessels in the lungs, so the lung becomes damaged, and, and this is what infarction is called. Um, the other thing, though, that we also know is, is that when somebody with sickle cell has fat embolization or when they have um, a lot of sickling going on, they also uh, have uh, evidence of increased clotting. And, and some of these infarctions actually occurred because they develop blood clots in the legs and then these travel to the lungs and infarction. So very significant that over ha almost half the time, they weren't able to find any uh, real etiology for why there was, uh, this was occurring, why the acute chest syndrome was occurring. And this is despite really, really aggressive uh, attempts to, to make a diagnosis. And so um, about half of the time, we're, we're really not able to figure out why it's occurring and we have to just treat it as a syndrome. Um, and then this is just a table of some of the data. It shows that, that pulmonary fat embolism occurs and in fact that it occurs in all age groups. Um, there are also a large number of different kinds of infections that occur, and, and many of these are what we call atypical infections. And it had always been thought that, that the pneumococcus was the main in, uh, infection that was occurring when somebody with sickle cell had a pneumonia, but it actually turns out that these atypical infections infections caused by uh, chlamydia and mycoplasm were, were the most common. And then uh, sometimes it was related to viruses or other bacteria, and, and we'll actually come back to that a little bit later. So infection occurs in about a third of the individuals, and it can be a virus, or it can be a bacteria, uh, or uh, the mixed infections where it starts with a virus and then that becomes a bacterial infection. Now, there's another very recent uh, report that I, I also want to highlight because it really shows some uh, new information that I think is, is changes both the fact that uh, uh, of what causes acute chest syndrome, but also uh, is associated with a with a um, uh, a really better outcome than that one would um, anticipate from the uh, comprehensive study of sickle cell disease or the um, uh, the acute chest syndrome group. Um, and th this is a, 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 a retrospective study where they used an administrative data set. And by that, I mean, they used data that was collected mainly for billing purposes. And uh, it's called the Kids Inpatient Database. Um, and um, this um, takes the word of the individual that was actually coding the diagnosis. And when, when, when an individual is discharged from the hospital, uh, we list all of the diagnoses and procedures that the individual has. And uh, this is fed into a database. Uh, and that information then can be searched and used to, to figure out what's going on. 
Um, it's not real reliable. And actually, in my experience, it's this kind of administrative data is, is very unreliable for acute chest syndrome because the, the syndrome isn't defined well enough so that it's easy for a physician to say it is or isn't um, occurring with certainty. And so we have to be a little bit leery of the, the data here, but I think there are some trends that are important. What they did is they looked at uh, four years, uh, 2002, six, 2009 and 2012, um, because this was a study of the entire pediatric inpatient database in the country. There were over 91,000 children that were identified. Uh, they had 8,400 uh, uh, cases of acute chest syndrome. Um, and those, the only individuals they looked at were sickle cell patients who were admitted for a vaso-occlusive crisis, for a pain crisis. And so this is a little bit selected towards individuals who were coming to the hospital because they were in pain. Uh, but these were children. Now, and what they found is the, the actual incidence of acute chest syndrome increased over uh, the four years. And I, I think that, that that reflects more a, a, an improved recognition of this by physicians than it does an actual real increase in the, the prevalence. Um, they also clearly documented that this was primarily a problem for younger children and that the incidence of just syndrome uh, decreased with age. And again, this was across a pediatric population uh, who were less than 19 years of age. Uh, females had slightly less acute chest syndrome than males did. Uh, another very interesting observation that they had was that there was really no difference uh, in the occurrence in, based on sickle cell type. That is sickle thalassemia, sickle uh, C disease, and uh, sickle cell anemia SS all had a very similar uh, rate of acute chest syndrome. Uh, they also identified two associated risk factors, asthma and uh, obstructive sleep apnea. And uh, these are two disorders that, that um, uh, are uh, antecedents to acute chest syndrome. And, and again, we'll talk a, bit, a little bit about that with prevention. Uh, they also were able to also document the, the fall association. And, and I, I show that here. This is the data on the, um, the occurrence over time. Um, and here are the date, months across the bottom and the number of uh, the percentage in, uh, of hospitalizations for acute chest. And you can see that uh, during the, the winter months, it's much higher. Um, it's lower in the summer. And then it, in the fall, it goes up again. And they looked across uh, different regions in the country, and you can see a very similar pattern in all of the regions in the country. So acute chest syndrome is, is very much less common in the summer, and it's more common in the fall and in the winter. Um, and uh, this is a very busy table, and I, I'm just going to use a couple words to describe it. And I think one of the important things was was that if you had acute chest syndrome, uh, you were you stayed in the hospital longer than you did, and that that is something that would be pretty obvious uh, for, for that. Um, it's a severe complication of a pain crisis, and obviously you'd be in the hospital longer if you had it. But I think something that was very important that they found was that their mortality from acute chest syndrome was less than one percent across the board. Um, in all of the years and seem to be possibly decreasing. And so I think with improved recognition and treatment that the outlook for acute chest syndrome nowadays is much better than it might have been uh, predicted from some of the earlier studies. And so I, that's rather encouraging. Now I'm gonna show you a few things that I think are, are important because Acute chest syndrome is really hard to diagnose in sickle cell disease. And this is a, a, a case that I think is, it illustrates something that's extremely common. And this is a young uh, male that presented with severe chest pain. And his chest x-ray was negative and he had no other symptoms that 
really sounded like acute chest syndrome. And so we went ahead and did a bone uh, scan. And, and what we found was there were numerous areas in the bone scan that were positive. And, and, and what this means is these are areas of the ribs that have been damaged by sickling and the, the, the uptake of the radioactive material that we see on the uh, radar x-ray image uh, represents a healing that's starting to occur in these areas of damage. And so in adults, very commonly, the chest pain that we see is actually just related to sickling in the ribs. And sometimes this is severe enough to cause actual damage to the bone that requires healing. And then, of course, the pain would be more severe. Uh, and this uh, pain in the chest wall is, uh, can, can also lead to an individual not taking deep enough breaths. And we'll come back to that when we, when we prevention. Um, the other thing that certainly occurs in acute chest syndrome is seen here. And what you hear, see over here is the left lung field is, is perfectly normal and clear. You can again see the heart and the ribs. Over here, it's all white. It's, it's whoops. It's opaque. And this is, this is an infiltrate, and this is in the middle lobe. So this is a clear x-ray picture of pneumonia. And this type of pneumonia is, in the past has almost exclusively been associated with this organism, the pneumococcal organism. But as we'll find out in, in acute chest syndrome and in modern series, this is changing because of prophylactic penicillin and vaccination. Um, the other thing that, that we've come to appreciate in, in acute chest syndrome is how often um, obstruction of blood flow occurs. And, and this is a, a different type of radioactive study. This is called a lung scan. And two things are done. A, a radioactive material is inhaled. And on the uh, right side here, you see ventilation. And this is the radioactivity going to all of the areas of the lung. It's a little white here because of the heart. But you can see the lungs have very homogeneous uh, uh, distribution of the radioactivity, showing that the air is getting to all parts of the lung. Later on, we scan again. And this actually looks at blood flow to the areas of the lung. And in this individual, what you see are areas here in the lung fields that aren't getting any blood flow. So the air is getting there, but the blood isn't getting there. And uh, probably a very common cause of this is the fact that there's just sickling and that's plugging up the blood vessels. But we also are coming to realize that actual true blood clots breaking loose from the veins and the legs are also common. And those blood clots are obstructing areas of the lung. Uh, and uh, this is a, a very uh, significant cause of chest syndrome. And then finally, this is a picture of a lung. And, and it's a little complicated, but I wanted to show you. This is a blood vessel here. And this is the muscle on the outside of the blood vessel. Uh, these little areas where you see nothing, those are the air spaces where the oxygen uh, comes in. It, it passes into these very small blood vessels and then into these large blood vessels. Uh, and that's the way we get oxygen into your blood. And what you see here are this big blood vessel is plugged. And it's, these are clear spaces, and these clear spaces represent areas where fat is present in the, in the, in the blood vessel. And this is called pulmonary fat embolization. And these uh, fat globules plug up the blood vessel, so the blood can't get there. The oxygen is there, but the blood can't get there, and so the oxygen becomes very, very low. This also occurs in the brain, and this probably explains why individuals with severe acute chest syndrome often have uh, problems uh, with their neurologic symptoms, uh, thinking and, and with level of consciousness because the blood vessels to the brain are being plugged uh, in this manner 
Uh, this can also occur in the kidneys and other parts of the body. So pulmonary fat embolization is a really important cause, and not only in that it's relatively frequent, but also when it occurs, it causes a very severe a form of acute chest syndrome. Um, and uh, going back to uh, the uh, chest study to talk about the different types of infection, um, one of the real um, important findings that, that we've come to be aware of is that these atypical patients with chlamydia and uh, mycoplasma are important. Um, uh, the pneumococcal infection is less important and staphylococcal infections, staph aureus infections are also kind of prominent. This occur very uh, often as a complication of influenza. And so uh, getting a staph infection after influenza is a very serious complication that can occur and cause acute chest syndrome. And then another thing that they identified that was very common was parvovirus causing acute chest syndrome. And usually we associate parvovirus and sickle cell disease with a plastic crisis where individuals get very anemic because they're not making new red cells. But it also causes acute chest syndrome. And this, again, is a very severe form of acute chest syndrome. Are there any questions to this point? Anything that isn't clear that you'd like me to go over? There's a question here, yeah. Dr. Eckman. Um, it says that at a previous appointment, I had a physician say that he could not hear any infiltrates. That comment, that comment confused me. How do you, what does an infiltrate sound like? I thought you can only see them. So, technically, or she wasn't completely clear, but the stethoscope is actually better at telling whether there is fluid in the lungs than an x-ray is. And I could listen to a chest with the stethoscope. I could often pick up the fact that there was fluid in the lung uh, that the x-ray didn't show. There wasn't enough of it for the x-ray to be positive but I could clearly hear it. And there's several ways you can hear it. You can hear it by actually hearing kind of a crackly or gurgling sound. Uh, you can also have the individual say E, and when they say E in the lung is clear, it comes across as an E in the stethoscope. If there's any fluid in the, in the lung, it will be changed to an A, and the E to A is a very good, uh, uh, finding that tells you that there is an infiltrate there, even though chest x-ray can't see it. And, and very often, if you do a chest x-ray two or three days later, you'll clearly see the infiltrate in exactly the same area where you heard it on extra, on, on, on uh, exam with the stethoscope. So the stethoscope is actually a picking up early infiltrates than, than the chest x-ray is. It's more sensitive. And I know it's confusing because you can't certainly, you know, infiltrate is usually reserved to um, for, for a finding by x-ray. But those physical findings are indicative of an infiltrate being present, even though you can't see it. And so I consider the, you know, what we call rails or the E to A examination finding that that equals an infiltrate uh, that's going to be there in the uh, in, in subsequent chest x-rays. Does that help? Um, thank you. Yes, I think so. Spencer, please, please, please write back to me if you need more um, information. I have a, diff a couple of other questions here. Okay. One is, is there a short-term treatment that would sustain and or strengthen after acute chest syndrome discharge? For example, one to two months of breathing treatment after the discharge has this been to help. So can I come back to that? <laughs> okay, absolutely. I'd like uh, one more thing. Okay. Um, there's how do you help a patient differentiate between acid reflux, asthma attack, and acute chest? Treat them both. 
that's very important. I'll come back to that. Um, and I'll, okay. I'll explain that. And when I talk about treatment and prevention, that, that's very important. Got it. Okay. And one more question. Can excessive protein, as in the system, trigger acute chest? It says excessive protein as in questions. Can you visual writing that question, Yolanda? Can you clarify that a bit? I think these might be questions you're going to want to come back to, Dr. Ekman. Okay, let me finish with treatment and prevention, and then we'll we'll certainly have time to discuss them further because I think it'll be a little bit clearer after I talk about treatment and prevention. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So here, here we go. That was those questions actually were a great lead in because it's very important. So I'm, I'm going to talk about the general treatment and, and, and this is something that, that, that we've really gotten a lot better at. And I think it's really important. Um, first of all, we do hydrate, you know, like with regular pain crisis and, and again, water is, is good. We have to be a little more careful with water and, and particularly salt water, sodium uh, uh, solutions, because if we overdo it, they'll make the infiltrates worse in the chest. And so we have to be more cautious with hydration, but it's still very important. We always give antibiotics and, and these antibiotics usually are directed to the usual kind of an, a community acquired pneumonia. So we use the same antibiotics uh, that we would use for somebody that came in with pneumonia who didn't have sickle cell disease. But really, this is this is an almost always that the, the antibiotics should be given. Oxygen is critically important. Usually the blood oxygen is low, as we've talked about, uh, and we need to treat it. We need to give oxygen and try and make the blood oxygen level as normal as possible. Uh, uh, and that sometimes is difficult. Um, incentive spirometry is exceedingly important, and uh, it's a very, very simple uh, procedure um, that anybody with chest pain should have, and certainly with acute chest. And, and basically, it's a little machine uh, where you suck in, and it lifts up a little plunger and you set a goal based on the size of the individual and you uh, take a couple puffs with this um, at least uh, three or four times an hour. And what I used, used to have my patients do was to, uh, if they're watching TV, that's a good, every time there was a, a uh, advertisement, uh, they would take their um, spirometer and take in 10 deep breaths. And this is a good way of keeping your lungs infiltrated. Um, and it helps clear out the infiltrates. It's very simple. And it's a form of respiratory therapy that, that you can um, uh, have at the bedside that's extremely effective. Studies shown that it, that, that it really can shorten the duration of an acute chest syndrome. Uh, the other thing that's extremely important is that if you have acute chest syndrome, take the uh, spirometer home and use it and continue to use it for the days or up to a week or two after you have acute chest, because that'll help you expand uh, your lungs and clear out any of the fluid that's still there. And it, it can be very helpful in terms of uh, cause a complete resolution of the acute chest. Uh, transfusion also is a very important part of, of the treatment of acute chest. Simple transfusion is, is almost always needed because, as I said earlier, the hemoglobin level falls rapidly. And it's extremely important to your hemoglobin level get high, particularly if your oxygen is low. And so we really like the hemoglobin level in the range of 9 to 10. And uh, if somebody's having an acute chest syndrome problem, transfusion is almost uh, a miracle. When, when we give transfusion acutely with acute chest, the oxygen in the blood usually gets uh, better very rapidly and, and uh, it, it's really uh, helpful. Uh, if the 
it just doesn't get better. It continues to get worse if somebody is, continues to have a very low oxygen. Uh, then we go ahead and do an exchange transfusion to get the level of S hemoglobin less than um, 30 percent. Uh, bronchodilators are very important if there's wheezing present, and certainly an individual with asthma uh, treated with bronchodilators uh, if they're having asthma symptoms in addition to the acute chest. And steroids uh, are beneficial in a chest syndrome, and, and certainly we use them in the more severe cases. Uh, the reason the question mark is here is that when steroids are given to sickle cell patients with acute chest or even with just pain crisis, they help acutely, um, but there's a very, very high incidence of severe pain crisis within a week or two after being discharged and stopping the steroids. And so we don't use them in, in all individuals. And so um, the, the treatment of, of acute chest syndrome is extremely important and, and relatively straightforward. And as I think I showed with the data that I think we're doing a much better job of this and the mortality from this complication is marked much less. Skip this and we're gonna go through and then it's getting late and I will um, finish and then we'll have a little time for questions. And, and this is my most important slide. An, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Uh, Benjamin Franklin talking about something else, but great for medicine. And how do we prevent this? Well, first of all, you get um, uh, immunized for, uh, for pneumococcus and all of the common viruses. You get an annual flu shot. Uh, if you have a fever, you go see a doctor right away and get it treated. If you have respiratory symptoms, you don't wait until you're sick. Uh, you, you get seen right away and, 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 and treat it. If you have asthma or uh, obstructive sleep apnea, it's extremely important uh, to make sure that those are in good management and you're seeing a pulmonary specialist who's, who's really addressing those with you. Uh, and uh, those are sort of general things that everybody needs to do with, with acute chest syndrome. Uh, and, and they're effective. Again, the incentive spirometer is a, is a, a very important preventive uh, tool. You certainly can take these home and make sure you keep it clean and, and wipe off the mouthpiece with uh, alcohol and clean it uh, so it doesn't get infected with bacteria. But then um, if you have respiratory symptoms, this is something you can start at home. And all individuals who come into the hospital with acute pain crisis and have pain between their neck and their, their waist should have an incentive spirometer at the bedside and use that during your pain crisis. Tendency when you have chest wall pain and chest pain is not to take deep breaths and that'll predispose acute chest. And again, another study clearly showed that this reduced the, the um, frequency of acute chest very significantly uh, in individuals in the hospital for pain crisis. Um, chronic transfusions are considered in, in somebody who has repeated acute uh, chest syndrome. Uh, certainly after steroids have to be used, we often will keep an individual on transfusions for a month or two uh, to reduce the chances of them having a uh, uh, rebound pain crisis or acute chest from uh, the tapering of the steroids. And so that's something that certainly is considered with repeated acute chest syndrome. We've talked about hydroxyurea extensively, but I want to clearly point out that the use of hydroxyurea uh, cut the number of uh, acute uh, chest syndrome episodes in half. And so anybody who's had one or certainly anybody with two episodes of acute chest should strongly consider having hydroxyurea as part of their treatment. Um, and we're very hopeful that, that that the hydroxyurea in this group in particular will lead to an improved outcome. Um, and uh, they'll have less acute chest and less chances of dying from acute chest. And then 
because the lung becomes a target organ as people age, we're hoping that this will also translate into less problems with respiratory failure uh, as they get older uh, and uh, again, improving uh, the prognosis for them uh, on hydroxyurea. Uh, and the uh, uh, recommendations from the NIH clearly say that acute chest syndrome in adults and children um, is an indication to uh, go ahead and, and start hydroxyurea, or at least strongly consider it. And then finally, um, bone marrow transplant is definitely considered in individuals who've had one or more episodes of acute chest syndrome. It's basically been one of the entry criteria for any of the studies. And we now have individuals that the survival with transplant is over 90%. Uh, and the cure of the sickle cell disease is occurring in about 85% of individuals. And so an individual who's having repeated acute chest syndrome, uh, who is in, uh, uh, is eligible for transplant should strongly consider this as a form of, of therapy. Okay, I'm going to end there and now I'll uh, hopefully answer any other questions. I hope that the talk about treatment and prevention will answer some of the questions that we've already had before, but I'm sure there are maybe other ones. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Eckman. And yes, we do have several questions. To go back to the one we skipped, how do you help a patient differentiate between acid reflux, asthma attack, and acute chest? Oh, <laughs> that is an extremely complicated question. I think that the um, there there probably is not a way of separating them because the the occurring together is very likely a syndrome in itself. Uh, individuals who have asthma have a uh, actual pre predilection to having uh, gastric reflux or GERD. And so those are probably two of the uh, same um, uh, symptoms. And as I clearly uh, stated, the, the uh, asthma is a risk factor for having an acute chest. So what, what I can suggest is, is that uh, when, in, when you're having uh, reflux, that needs to be treated as one problem. Uh, the asthma needs to be treated very aggressively and, and certainly uh, uh, talk, working with a pulmonary specialist and maximizing uh, therapy of the asthma would be very important. And then um, the, the occurrence of acute chest on top of it would really have to be related to having, uh, you know, the onset of a fever, having um, uh, reduction in the oxygen and infiltrates on chest x-ray. Um, and uh, that would be a the th sort of a complication of the asthma, I think. Um, so it, 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 any diff any slot where there you were having symptoms of all of them, differentiation would be very difficult. And, and the only thing I can say in terms of advice is that would be a very, very important time to go ahead and go to the emergency room or see your physician uh, because you'd need a very uh, careful evaluation to see which one was causing most of the problem. Uh, probably all of them would be active problems and it's just a matter of which one is giving you the most difficulty at that very moment. Okay, thank you. Next question. Can excessive protein in the system, as in shakes, contribute to triggering acute chest? Not that I'm aware. Of. I've, I've never seen any uh, studies that would, would indicate that. Um, it would, it, it might depend on what was causing the high protein in the, in the blood, but no, usually, I don't, I don't think it's associated with having high protein that I'm aware of. Okay, thank you. Um, she just clarified, she meant protein from consumption. Consuming more protein had any relation to acute chest? 
on not again not that i'm aware of that I, I i don't think that that just having a high protein diet would be necessarily a risk factor the only association there might be if if you were consuming protein that you had an allergy to uh like somebody that had a fish allergy or something like that but i'm not aware of any direct association with protein intake and um and uh, acute chest unless it was through an allergy and and um, again uh, that would that would be a, uh, something that you really have to confer with uh, your physician uh, and and do um, allergy evaluation to see if it, it might be related to um, an allergy to a protein product thank you okay next question do you know what would cause patients to have increased chest pain while receiving Ventolin through breathing treatment? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. Uh, do you know what would cause patients to have increased chest pain while receiving Ventolin through breathing treatment? I believe that's a steroid. Yeah, I think. I don't know why that would occur, and again, that that really requires a discussion with the physician that's prescribing the ventolin. I'm not aware of any direct association. Um, individuals who are taking uh, other types of asthma inhalants can feel chest discomfort from it, uh, and uh, but I would definitely uh, talk to your pulmonary pulmonary doctor, whoever's giving you the ventolin, and, and discuss that with them, make them aware of that. Thank you. Next question. Patient has sleep apnea. What is more important during an acute chest episode, the CPAP machine or oxygen treatment, or can they be used simultaneously? Um, they both are important and they should be used simultaneously. And there are ways of doing that. The respiratory therapy uh, consultation during those episodes would be uh, required and um, uh, both should be done. Uh, that's very important. Uh, there's a different type, they would use PAP or some other type of respiratory support that would do the same thing as CPAP, uh, but also allow administration of oxygen. Um, and that would require respiratory therapist intervention at the time. Wonderful. Thank you. And last question. What diagnostic test can be done to determine if fat is the cause? So the answer to that is there really aren't any good ones. Um, one of the things that we can do is actually stain the urine um, for the fat. As I said, the kidneys sometimes um, are, are, are usually are affected when there's pulmonary fat embolization, and you can actually detect the um, fat globules in the urine by using a special stain. Um, the other way of, of, of making the diagnosis is by doing a bronchoscopy where they actually would look down into the lungs with a, with a bronchoscope, and then they would do what is called a lavage where they put in some salt water and, and then suck it out and then look at that under a microscope and stain that for fat. Um, a lung biopsy is sometimes done during bronchoscopy and then that also could be seen for fat. fat. But often we just have to use it as a presumptive diagnosis and, and treatment again for pulmonary fat embolization is, is blood transfusion. And, and I don't know, and I don't think anybody knows how it works, but it does seem to be very important in terms of reversing uh, fat embolization syndrome. And, and so blood transfusions are really very important treatments. Um, the urine test is the most sensitive, but it's still not, it, it only is positive. And I think about half of the cases where uh, there's documented uh, pulmonary fat embolization. Wonderful. Thank you. Let me to see if anyone sent me a direct, if there are any more of their direct private questions. No. Um, does anyone else have any last questions? Please type it in the chat. Well, 
Well, thank you very much, Dr. Ekman. This was fantastic. Um, everyone, I do want to remind you that this information is incredibly valuable. This was fantastic to me um, personally, but it is not meant to replace consultation with your doctor. So if you have specific questions of your or your child's medical care, please talk to your physician. Dr. Breckman, thank you so, so, so much. This was wonderful. And it does explain a particular question I've had about why acute chest doesn't often show up at first on the x-ray. Okay. And hearing you explain it was, was wonderful. So thank you very much. We are glad and delighted that you've joined us. Well, thank um, you. Everyone. All of the great uh, questions. Everyone, the they were. They were wonderful. Uh, everyone, don't forget. Our next class is next Tuesday, and the fabulous Dr. Ekman is joining us again to talk about avascular necrosis. Yeah, I'm going to... Don't forget to register. Go ahead. I'm going to broaden that a little bit, and I'm going to talk a little bit about bone health in general. I think that uh, uh, we should talk about some other aspects of the bone health and in addition to avascular necrosis, if that's okay. Oh, that sounds wonderful. And a commenter, warrior parent Yolanda Lewis replied, awesome, in all caps, exclamation point. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for joining us, everyone. We will see you next week. Please don't forget, there's also a registration for this class. You do not have to, but we appreciate if you would register and um, share some information about where you're joining us from. Any, any last comments? Thanks again for inviting me. Will. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. And we'll see you all next Tuesday. Thanks, Dr. Ekman. Thank you. Bye. Bye.